All right, we are recording. Hello, right. everybody. Welcome. Um, sorry, Robert. <laughs> I just want to welcome everyone tonight um, to our introduction to reptiles and amphibians and remind people that um, this coming Saturday, um, you can come out um, at two o'clock to, um, to the center and we're gonna be doing a reptile and amphibian hunt so you can help us you know, see what reptiles and amphibians we have around. It's a great citizen science project. So hopefully everyone will come out and enjoy. I'm gonna turn it over to Robert um, and let him take it away. Good evening, everybody. Um, tonight we'll be looking over um, an introduction to our uh, program, our PARS program, which we'll, um, we'll be doing on Saturday. It is a very uh, fun event. It is a great time to get outside and uh, have a look at the uh, various reptiles and amphibians that we have uh, here in Bucks County um, and especially at our uh, location at Honey Hollow. Um, let's uh, get started here and uh, let me pull this up and hang on. Why are you giving me a hard time? All right, let me try that again and There we go. It was not wanting to show up for some reason. Let's get this slideshow started, folks. Okay, so welcome to our, the Pennsylvania Amphibian and Reptile Survey. That's where PARS comes from. Uh, it's uh, put together by the Mid-Atlantic Center for Herpetology and Conservation. MACOC is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the conservation and study of amphibians and reptiles through advocacy, education, and execution of research by professional herpetologists and ecologists in the Mid-Atlantic Mid and Northeastern United States. Uh, the organization was founded in 2010. Um, you can see they have several founders and partners, including the PA Fish and Boat Commission, the, PA Department of Conservation and National, Natural Resources, the National Fish and Wildlife and Foundation, the USDA, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, the PARS is a program, as an atlas project launched in 2013. The goal of the project is to determine the distribution and status of all amphibians and reptiles throughout Pennsylvania building upon previous ATLAS efforts and combining modern technology with an army of citizen scientists known as herpers. That's what we will be, herpers. Uh, in case you didn't know, herpetology is the study of amphibians and reptiles. Herps is slang for those creatures. Uh, some things we might see, um, and these are things that we pretty much see pretty commonly out in the wilds at uh, Honey Hollow, uh, we find salamanders. Uh, typically we find four different species. They're often seen. We have two others that are less commonly. Um, we have turtles. We should be lucky and see two species that are quite common and another that is less. Uh, snakes, we see one species quite often. Um, the three others less commonly. We see plenty of frogs and toads. Um, they are most everywhere. Um, how, will we, how will we know what, we, what it is that we see? Um, what we recommend for you to uh, download, um, and I recommend this to anybody, whether they are coming out to do a program with us or not, is an app called iNaturalist. Um, iNaturalist is a joint initiative of the California Academy of Sciences and the National Geographic Society. Best of all, it's free. Where the, the, the quality of an app it is and the information that you get, it's amazing that it's free. Um, it, it is so useful. 
Um, every observation can contribute to biodiversity science from the rarest butterfly to the most common backyard weed. Um, you can discover anything using iNaturalist. Um, it has uh, so much, uh, a, we, we've been using it steady for the last couple of days around the house even, um, things that we've been finding outside in our yard. And we do, you can find anything from insects to reptiles to, to plants that you're not sure of. Uh, the app is available for iPhone and Android. Um, it does not require Wi-Fi or cell service, which is good when you're out in the wild, especially in a place like Honey Hollow where there can be dips and what kind of connectivity you have. Um, for more information, visit www.inaturalist.org to learn more. Um, you can find it in the App Store. Again, I highly recommend it. It is so useful and it's fun because uh, all those things that you find that you're not sure of, uh, you can get a pretty definitive answer in most cases. Um, so let's get moving. Let's go down and some places that we'll look on our journey. We'll be flipping some logs. We'll be looking under rocks in the streams. And those are places like that are where we might find salamanders. Uh, some salamanders we might see when we'll be moving across here from left to right would be uh, a northern dusky, the top four are, are more common salamanders, the dusky being a, a murky brownish color with some uh, variated spots that range from gray to, to brown on their sides. Um, they're pretty common, we find them quite a bit. The northern two-lined is another salamander. They are very distinct. They kind of have a, a caramelly type color. They're like a yellowy brown but they have two distinct black lines that run along their body from, from nose to tail. Um, there's even a little bit of yellow that, that lines that. Um, they're a very uh, neat looking salamander. Um, we, they're, they're very common. Uh, we usually find those. Uh, the Eastern redback, very distinct. Um, typically when you find those, they will be um, dark, brown, gray, black along the sides, but they have a very definitive red-orange stripe that runs from the top of their head uh, down their tail. Now they do have a stage where they are darker, where they're mostly dark. Um, when they're like that, you can still see that red line that is on them. It might be a little bit tougher to see, but you can still uh, tell that that's what it is. Uh, another one that we find, we don't find this guy as often, as the others, but oh boy, is it a treat when we do the northern red salamander. Um, now these other guys, the dusky, the two line, the, the, the red back, they mostly maybe will get three, four inches long. Um, they might be, they don't get, they're not big uh, salamanders at all. The northern red, however, um, we can find it in several different stages earlier in the, the spring. Uh, my kids and I were out and we found some that were, that were close to that size. But when we find these, they are typically three inches and up. Um, they're a bigger salamander, they are girthy, um, and they just have that stunning red-orange coloration with the black speckled spots along them. Um, really, really special to find those. I, I get so happy whenever, whenever I do. Um, we had camp last week and we were lucky one day to find two in one place. Uh, that was a real treat uh, for me, and it was an extra special treat for the kids because that's not something that they typically do get to see. Now, going down here on the bottom, um, I'm going to go right to the eastern mud uh, salamander. That's the uh, orange-red guy that is on the right-hand side on the bottom there. Now, notice it looks an awful lot like the northern red, doesn't it? Um, they have very similar markings, but if you notice here, Notice that the, the red salamander, the northern red, has quite a few more um, spots. Uh, the, the eastern mud uh, salamander has fewer spots. In fact, it, it barely looks speckled at all. Um, there are some other things that you can tell. Um, one of those is that the, northern, the eastern mud, rather, its nose is blunter and it has brown eyes, where the northern red will have yellow to gold. Eyes. So that's a real telltale sign 
if you find one of those and you check out the eyes, um, it will tell you definitively what it is you have found. Another really neat one that we find, and we don't, I haven't seen one at all this year yet. Um, last year, we seemed to find a lot of these. Last year was really neat because we, we were finding a lot of this fellow here. This is the Northern Slimy. Um, he kind of has like a, almost a, um, a blue gray to, or a dark black to gray to bluish kind of coloration. And it's marbled. It has really, really neat spots on it that kind of give it a marbled appearance. Um, there are another salamander that doesn't get very big. It is about the same size as the, uh, say, a, a two line, where they maybe will be anywhere from a half an inch to uh, two and a half, three inches long. Um, but these are all really special animals. It is great when we find those. Uh, we find these typically under, um, under rocks along the edges of the stream and even in the stream. They are um, amphibians after all, so they do begin their lives in the water. Um, they start off in a phase where they do have gills. Uh, these gills are evident. Um, they stick out just from behind the eyes. And they look kind of like frilly gloves that uh, hang off of the, the sides of the uh, animal's head. Um, and this is how they get their oxygen when they're younger, as they age, they lose those, they start breathing more through nostrils, but they also absorb a lot of oxygen through their skin. Um, so we need to be really careful when we find these and handle them, especially now that uh, we have gotten so used to using a lot of uh, hand soaps and hand sanitizers. If we have those on our skin and we touch these guys, they will absorb it and it will hurt them badly. It can even kill them. Um, I liken it when I'm explaining it to children, I liken it to when you're taking a bath or a shower and you get soap in your eyes, how awful that feels. Um, imagine having that over your whole body um, is probably what it is like. So we need to be sure that before we handle any of these and we find them, we dip our hands in the, in the water, maybe dip them in the, the sand and the mud to rub them together to make sure we've got good uh, nature hands um, and we can handle these guys. I try not to handle them too much. Uh, usually when we're doing programs, what we'll do is use a, a, a catching net and we'll catch them in small nets and then put them into a uh, container that's filled with water so we can get a good look at them and observe them for a bit before putting them back. Um, we always try and put these back where we found them uh, because that's just the way you do when you're out in nature. Um, but we should find these. We find these, like I say, along the stream, the banks, inside, and rocks. We also find them, they're also terrestrial, so we do find them often by rolling rotten logs, uh, looking under uh, piles of leaves, uh, things like that is where they like to live, where they can eat things like uh, small insects, worms, and uh, things of that nature. Let's move on. Turtles. They're reptiles. Uh, we should see some of those. Um, if we're lucky, well, let's start here in the middle with the eastern painted. Uh, we should have no problem seeing those. Uh, we have those on our pond. Um, any given sunny day, you can go out into onto the pond and you can see them on the uh, far side. They usually are lining. Um, we have a couple logs that are down that they, they pile on each other onto that. Uh, they are there. In the spring months, we see them often along the edges of the pond and up on some of our trails even as the females are wandering to find good places to lay their eggs. Another turtle that we might see down by the pond is the one on the far left. That is a snapping turtle. Uh, we do have a few of those in our pond. Um, we have a couple that are pretty good size. Uh, snapping turtles can get to be pretty big. Um, think uh, close to manhole cover size. I mean, they get to be, I don't know that we have any that big in there. We do have one really large one that I've seen, but they can get to be quite large. Um, and you don't want to handle those. You want to leave them be, and just uh, have a good look at those. Um, I've seen quite a few, or at least evidence of them this summer and spring. A lot of times you don't get to see the turtle itself, but you can see its action in the pond. You can see where it's moving around. They, they like to dwell in the bottom, in the mud, they come up and, and get some sun every once in a while and get a good breath. Uh, but they hang out mostly in the mud uh, down where they can feed and just be comfortable. Um, they're pretty secretive creatures. 
Uh, they feed on things like fish, worms, insects, things that are down near the bottom of the, uh, of the pond. Uh, some of them have a, a lure-like appendage on their tongue that they can wiggle like a worm that draws fish in. Um, but they're neat. They're neat. Uh, we might get a chance to see the shadow of one uh, moving under the pond on Saturday, um, if we're lucky. Now, one that we see, we usually see, check over here on the right side, that is an eastern box turtle. Uh, notice that guy, he has some beautiful orange coloration there on the skin, doesn't he? Uh, they're pretty neat. Um, we usually will see maybe, they're, they're not as common anymore. We usually will find one or two a year. Uh, we'll see them, they'll come wandering up. This year we got lucky in one week in camp, we had uh, one that climbed right up the stairs. I don't know what on earth it was doing climbing the steps, but it climbed the stairs and the kids got to visit with that for a little bit. Um, but we see a few every year you know, maybe two, three, they come up out of the woods. They, they live in woodland area um, where they wander and they feed on plants, grasses, berries, uh, insects. Uh, they're really neat. Um, they, they, there's telltale ways that you can, that you can tell um, what they are as well uh, insofar as their, their gender, their sex. Uh, the males have red eyes where the females have more of a lighter color, orange. Um, their, their shell shape is also different. The female have an indentation on the back side of their shell where the male's um, shell is shaped more like a, a helmet, like a, a soldier helmet, if you can imagine. They kind of flare out along the edges there. Uh, it would be a real treat if we got to find another one of those. Well, let's move on to snakes. Uh, there are several different, there are a few different snakes that we may see. Um, just a note. Uh, there are reports of uh, venomous snakes in our area, copperheads being um, the one that I hear of the most. Uh, however, we have never found a venomous snake uh, at, at Bucks County Audubon. Um, I don't know of anybody finding any directly in our area. I know once you cross the river over into New Jersey, they seem to be a, a bit more common, um, but we've never found anything like that here. Uh, starting from the left with the eastern garter snake, uh, we do find those. Those are very common. Um, in fact, we had uh, three or four of them that uh, would sun daily uh, just out of our back door um, at, the na at the visitor center. Um, they, they liked hanging out there along the, the weedy edge uh, of the um, back patio. Well, a couple of them were pretty big. Uh, typically, we find them and they're maybe eight, 10 inches long, but they can get to be a good uh, one, two feet if you, if you find an older one that's been managed to stay healthy and you know get some years behind it. Um, they are mostly insectivorous. Uh, they might eat some smaller frogs or toads if they get lucky and find them. Um, one of them that we had though out back was truly stunning. He was a really big guy. I haven't seen him uh, for a couple weeks now, but he was uh, sunning daily through the spring and early summer. Another one that we find, um, and uh, Marissa um, on our staff, she really seems to have a knack for finding these. I know when I've been out with her um, in the woods and we've happened to find snakes, there's been several times where she just pulls these guys out. Uh, I don't know that I've ever found one when she hasn't been around. Um, but they're a neat snake. They're a darker coloration, and you can notice that they are very recognizable by this white ring around their neck. I wonder how they get their name. Uh, they are neat uh, snakes. Beautiful snake that we find, and I had never seen one of these before, and I've been lucky. I found a couple of them this year. I found one very large one uh, early in the spring. Unfortunately, I think it came out of hibernation a little too soon and it, and it, and it passed. Um, but we're lucky sometimes and see this third guy here, the Eastern milk snake. Have a look at those colors, those patterns on its skin. Um, they, they're a striking snake um, and then their coloration can be quite different from snake to snake. Uh, this guy looks like he's got some coppery reddish brown along with some pinkish hues on his scales and I've seen them anywhere from where they look like that to where they've been red and gray. Uh, 
brown and tan. Uh, just, just a stunning snake, fairly docile. Um, I've caught, whenever I've found them, I've been able to catch them pretty easily. And um, they're not very you know, aggressive at all. Um, they're really interesting to visit with. They're quite smooth, which is really neat. So they have a very shiny appearance and they have that, you know, snakes often, people who don't know snakes or are frightened by them think that snakes look slimy. Well, this is one of those snakes that can clearly uh, give you that impression. Um, very neat snakes. Um, smooth compared to the garter snake. Garter snakes are often uh, kind of roughish. Um, finally, our last snake on this list that we might get uh, lucky to see, we often find these down around our pond. Uh, they are an aquatic snake. They like to hang out around the water. Uh, this is a northern water snake. Um, they're characterized by their dark gray on gray coloration. Um, and these guys can be a little more aggressive from what I understand. If you get near where they've nested or if you get near where they just like to be, uh, they can be pretty grumpy with you. Um, now, if they bite you, they're not venomous, they don't have fangs, but they do have rows of, um, they've got a mouthful of teeth. Their teeth are, if you imagine, if you've ever caught a fish and had your thumb in a fish's mouth, how they have those rows of, of sharpish nubs that they use for teeth. That's kind of what this guy has. They have teeth so that when they catch their prey, their prey can't escape from their mouth. They hold it into place. Um, they're pretty neat snakes. They can get pretty large, um, uh, girthy, a girthy snake. They can get pretty uh, uh, on the thick side. We find these often down on the rock ledge um, at the pond and uh, under the bridge area there at the spillway, uh, we find them. Um, I had one experience with, those, with one further up the stream, actually all the way up at the far end of our stream um, with a school group who found one in a bush. And when I was looking for it, they were telling me it was there and I didn't see it. It turns out that it was actually in the bush and I was looking on the ground when I actually should have been looking straight ahead because I was face to face with it. Uh, quite lucky that it wasn't in a real grumpy mood that day. So let's move on to our next uh, creature here. And these are the frogs and toads that we might see. Um, typically this time of year, we, we find quite a few of those, although the last couple times I've been out, I haven't seen many. I've heard them, um, but these are the ones that we normally see. Um, on the left, we, starting from the left, we have the American toad. Uh, they are everywhere. We had a lot of them in the spring. We had tons of uh, tadpoles from them as well. Um, I'm not seeing many of the young that we normally would see, but we're still finding some of the the adults, the older ones that are around, um, we typically find those in the wooded areas and along the woods edge. Bullfrogs, I have not seen any of those around the pond, but I sure have heard them. Um, I've heard them in the middle of the day. In fact, uh, yesterday when I was out in the evening, I did hear some down by the pond and often in the distance, uh, down below where the stream goes. Uh, we have a bit of a wetland area down there and you could hear them croaking away down there. They have the, the steady drumming, you know, croaking sound that you, you think of when you think of big frogs. Uh, and they can get quite big. We know that they're in our pond because when we do dippings um, with nets, we often will find bullfrog uh, tadpoles. Um, we can tell that that's what they are. They're a bit bigger and they have a pattern on them. Uh, the next frog we may find, and we find this down by the pond and in our stream quite a bit, is the green frog. Um, they are characterized by this green coloration that they have on the tops of their heads. Uh, sometimes their whole body will be green, but other times, like as you can see with this fellow right here, they kind of will fade into a brownish color. Um, one thing I want to note about the frogs too, we can tell whether it's a male or a female by looking, if you can see right here behind this green frog's eyes, they have this, this circle right in there. Since it's behind its eyes, what do you think that might be? Well, that's its, it's where its ear should be, right? So that's called tympanic membrane. That's what allows the, the frog to hear. And with the male frogs, they are typically, their tympanic membrane is bigger in circumference than their eyes. So if we find a frog that has a large tympanic membrane, a membrane behind its ear or behind its eye that's bigger than the eye, we know that we found a fellow there. We found a male. 
Um, when they're smaller, we know that we have found a female. Let's move on to our last frog, and that is the pickerel frog. Uh, we find these a lot, and often we'll confuse those with another frog, the leopard frog. Um, now, they're, they're, they look very similar. They're similar in size. They're similar in shape. Um, I know there's a, a couple things, and I can't think of what they are, that you can tell what they are, something with the ridges that go down their, their sides. Um, I know Diane knows what that is. I, I can't remember. But the thing with leopard frogs is, is that they have spots like a leopard. So their spots are, are more of, a, of a, a round shape, where if you have a look at this guy, he's got more blocks. His spots are kind of blocky, um, making him, you know, resembling the, the fish, the pickerel fish, how they have the blocky markings on them. That's where they get this name from. They have that same kind of marking that they have. We find those quite commonly uh, down around the uh, stream. Um, especially in the marshy area. When we get down closer between the stream and the pond, uh, we find those down there quite a bit. Uh, another frog that, that's not on this list um, that we probably would not see, but we might get lucky to hear, would be tree frogs. Um, we can hear them chirping quite a bit in the, in the woods. Um, we have a couple that are living there, a couple gray tree frogs that are living right around the building. Um, and they make quite a bit of noise. Interesting thing about those is the other day during the hurricane, I stepped out um, into the woods for a second and they were everywhere. They, they seemed to be loving the weather on Tuesday, just making a, a ton of noise, uh, singing their hearts out. So it was pretty neat. So I think that wraps up everything that we have with that. So, excellent. Um, that sounds fabulous. We have lots of really, really cool reptiles and amphibians um, all around Bucks Audubon and Honey Hollow. So, hopefully, again, everyone will come out on Saturday, um, August the 8th. There we go. <laughs> I can remember the date. Um, at 2 o'clock to help us do our PARS reptile and Pennsylvania amphibian, amphibian and reptile survey. Um, so thank you all so much, and we'll hopefully see everyone soon. Have a good night, guys.